What do you think about the, the, the other black athletes like them who in their time have had influence or would have been in a position to have influenced people, their, their own people and this sort of thing, about their attitude, which is certainly slightly more moderate rather than yours. Right now, black people, when you show this show, are home jumping, home shouting, because they don't have the nerve to say what I'm saying, and nobody has never said it, and they're just so happy to see a black man who will stand up and jeopardize every court he's got to tell the truth. But when one man of popularity can let the world know the problem, he, can, uh, he might lose a few dollars himself telling the truth, might lose his life, but he's helping me. I'm gonna continue to stand with the people that are being oppressed. It's time to look in the mirror and ask ourselves, what are we doing to create change? To understand today, you've got to understand what happened yesterday. And there's one particular story from half a century ago that shouldn't be forgotten. It's known today as the Ali Summit. And it's remembered, for as much as anything else, a single image of some of the most famous athletes in the world back then. Side by side, united. The 1960s are often looked upon as the original decade of turmoil in modern America. You had Vietnam, the civil rights movement. Black people were fighting for their own basic human rights. And that included a young boxer from Kentucky by the name of Cassius Clay. Won the Olympic gold medal in Rome, Italy. Olympic champion, the Russians standing right here, and the pole right here. I'm defeating America's so-called threats or enemies, and the flag is going, ton, 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 ton. And I don't whoop the world for America. I took my gold medal, thought I'd invented something. I said, man, I know I'm gonna get my people freedom there. I'm the champion of the whole world, the Olympic champion. I know I can eat downtown now. And I went downtown that day, had my big old medal on, and went to restaurants. At that time, black things weren't integrated. The black folks couldn't eat downtown. The lady said, we don't serve Negroes. And I had to leave that restaurant in my home Town where I went to church and served in their Christianity and fought and daddy fought in all the wars, just wanted to go medal and couldn't eat downtown. I said something's wrong. For me, one of the more difficult aspects of our struggle is racism and white supremacy was created and constructed by white people. So if they constructed it, they're the only one that can deconstruct it. Black people in this country have been the victims of violence at the hands of the white man for 400 years. We will define black power. He will listen and recognize it. That's all. That's all. So many different black organizations, and they all had a different approach to freedom, equality, and justice. In the South, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, among others, practiced nonviolence while out west, the Black Panthers took a more assertive stance, as too, back east, did the Nation of Islam, which had among its adherents the young boxer who now went by the name Muhammad Ali. Black athletes all across the country were sizing up the different messages of all these groups, looking toward a path to equality. You had Malcolm, you had the Nation of Islam, Huey Newton and the Panthers, in the programs, they said when they walked the streets with guns like the police did. Revolution has come. Oh, the it's time to pick up the gun. Oh, the Revolution has come. Oh, the it's time to pick up the gun. In America, uh, black people are uh, treated very much as uh, the Vietnamese people. The police in our community occupy uh, our uh, area, our community as a foreign troop occupies territory. If you were the black star of a team, you had to be very careful in how you represented yourself. Period. The Browns, Jimmy Brown, blasts his way right down the middle with a sensational scoring run. You had to use your power, and you had to help those who were lesser from the standpoint of their football status. And uh, it was a great responsibility because, you know, you had to decide when to speak up and when not to. And I remember having this discussion with Dr. King. I told him, I said, Dr. King, I cannot march with you. As much as I respect and love you and what you're doing is magnificent, I will hurt the cause if I marched. I told him, I said, Dr. King, so what we'll do is we will help you to form an economic base.
I decided that economic development was really the way to go. And because athletes generated so much capital, I knew that uh, that would be a way to be able to make changes and bring our black athletes together. The Ford Foundation gave us a million dollar grant to show how we could work within the communities of the inner city and create and build an economic base so that people would have their own businesses. Our motto was produce, achieve, and prosper. And so our concentration was not a matter of integration. It was our equal rights and our ability to understand how to create a power base by dealing with economics and dealing with education. Well, I heard about it when I first got to the Browns. Uh, Jim Brown, John Wooten, uh, they would be talking about uh, the Black Economic Union. We had Ivy League individuals that had the kind of expertise that would go with the notoriety of the black athletes and the money that athletes could raise. So a lot of the shops that the Muslim Brothers set up, we were loaning the money for it. The mixed situation in the country was uh, complicated because there were a lot of black people that didn't like the black Muslims. One of the most dramatic things that Ali did and one of the most controversial things that he did was declare himself a black Muslim, a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That was like the kiss of death. I was going to ask him what attracted you to the, to the, the truth. The teachings of Elijah, Elijah Muhammad on how black people's been brainwashed, how we've been robbed of our names and slavery, we were robbed of our culture, we were robbed of our true history, so it left us a walking dead man. See, once you get a lot of notoriety in this particular country and people start thinking highly of you, then there's a whole aspect of what can you do to influence other people. Being a great heavyweight fighter had tremendous influence, not only on uh, black people, but it had an influence on white people also. And uh, the government didn't have an answer for that clear in their particular approach to him. He was a tremendous uh, threat. And one of his quotes was, Demvia uh, Conley never called me nigger. Viet Cong are not all bad, but America's still dropping bombs. In Hiroshima, the Japan wasn't bad, but she still dropped the bomb. In Korea, they weren't bad, but they still dropped the bomb. I was part of the military and I did what I was supposed to do for the military, but I wasn't gonna die voluntarily for the United States government. Man, I wasn't gonna kill myself. I'm not gonna commit suicide for a country that segregated me on the train to send me over there. In so many ways, the draft was an intersection between progressive America's resistance to the Vietnam War and the struggles of the civil rights movement. If your number was called in the draft, you had to report for duty regardless of how you felt about the war itself, or for that matter, how you felt about your country. Mohammed, there's also a story out over this weekend that later this week your draft status will be announced again as 1A. Now, what's your reaction to that, and will you go into the army in the ultimate if well, the government says you must? I've just heard about it. I haven't really read about it yet. I've been so busy. But uh, as I've said once, and uh, I'll say it again, I think it'll be wise to uh, face the government themselves and the uh, Justice Department because they're the ones who I'll have to see in the end. That's mm -hmm. the law. Jim calls me and he says, did you hear what happened? And I said, well, yeah, I heard what happened. He's talking about Ali. He says, hey, you know the champ didn't step forward. I see, right? He says, we got to support him. I said, no problem. He said, get the guys together. I said, John, you know, put it together. If we had a meeting with him and we got behind him, if he was right, and we felt that if we could stand up as a unit 
and we believe what he said, and if he was a conscientious objector, most of the minister, we would support him as a unit. And on June 4, 1967, in Cleveland, Ohio, it all came together. More than half a dozen NFL stars, plus two of basketball's biggest names, in Bill Russell and Lou Alcindor, all came together in Cleveland to meet with Ali and talk to him about his refusal to enter the military draft. Muhammad Ali, as a young kid, did he really understand what he was doing? Jim and, and the guys thought they should at least talk to him and try to be sure if he knew exactly what he was doing. This is the draft. This is not just an ordinary thing. You were drafted. All of us had served our military obligations. We all would go and do our service in the offseason. In other words, when we get through playing football, then we would go into, go into the service. And then during the year, you know, you'd go on the weekends. My take on it was that I had served, and all of the athletes, Joe, Joe Lewis and people like that, all went to the service. And that's what my thinking was, that why get yourself caught up in this? You go and what you'll be doing, you'll still be doing what you like to do, because that's the way the military would treat it. And then you'd come back home and continue your heavyweight fights. For me to tell him that I believe that you should have gone to the military just because I went, uh, that didn't mean that much to me. But to him, it would be still going against his religion. And that was more important to him than anything else. Well, that kind of blew my mind, so I had to step back. Because what he was saying now was so much stronger than me. After having sat with him three to four hours or whatever it was, I'm not sure of the time, and it was really like uh, standing up and being counted in a real war. Ali knew he was going to lose money, knew he was going to lose his championship. Uh, he just knew that he had to stand on his principles. Most people, when you take their livelihood, they'll make a U-turn on where they was going. But Muhammad Ali didn't make no U-turn. He said, over the dollars, man, I got principles. I'm a man, I'm gonna stand over the dollars. I believe in the Holy Quran. It says, we who declare ourselves to be righteous Muslims do not take parts in no wars, no way, fashion, or form which take the lives of other humans unless it's a holy war declared by God himself. And I think anybody is right, man, if he knew it was God calling him, he would fight for God. Russell said, champ, you have totally convinced me. He says, as a matter of fact, if you can get the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to just ease back on that rib and chop, I'll join y'all tomorrow. <laughs> when it was all over, he was still able to make a joke of it too because he said, guys, guys, the press is waiting on us. Press all over the place outside the door. He said, look, this is what we ought to do. We ought to all go out there and we tell the press that we believe in Muhammad Ali, thanks, and we're going to go into the service in his place. <laughs> I was about 12 going on 13 when the Ali summit happened. And I remember how impressive it was to me, because these were the biggest guys in sports. I mean, you talk about Muhammad Ali and Jim Brown and uh, Lou Alcindor, you couldn't get bigger than that. The courage of these individuals, I look at them as courageous individuals who understood that they could be blackballed and so forth and so on. So it wasn't no risk for me, because it didn't matter to me. I didn't value that role as a professional football player as much as I valued a role as a man supporting Ali. I knew I wasn't going to play football all of my life, but I do know that the rest of my life I had to be a man. There were 11 of them all together, flanking Ali on that monumental day in Cleveland. The champ was prepared to pay the biggest price. Stripped of his title belt, excommunicated from the sport he dedicated his life to. And there was also huge risk for the rest of the folks in that photograph. Consequences they would have to face themselves. 
All of these elements were part of the realities that they would spend their careers getting to know far too well. I saw racism. I understood that it existed in the league, but I'm on an airplane with the Cleveland Browns going to, to Los Angeles to play the Los Angeles Rams, and the owner comes up to me and asks me what I'm reading. I said, I'm reading a book. What book you read? I'm reading The Message to the Black Man by the Honorable, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He said, I don't want you to read that book. Now, this is a man talking to another man, telling him what to read. So it's obvious to me that Mr. Modell thought he owned me. He didn't think I was a player on his team. He said, I own you, man. I tell you what to read. It's just one big club with the owners. You know, they knew just one big club. And back then, and one of them called the other one and said, well, hey, don't deal with him. You know, he's a troublemaker or whatever. And they used that. And that's what they used to use back then in the 60s. I was blackballed because of uh, my attitude. And when they put me on waivers, the Laddick Falcons claimed me off of waivers. Then the Browns withdrew the waiver. Said, no, we're going to keep him. Then they put me on waivers again, and the Detroit Lions claimed me off of waivers. And then the Browns withdrew it. Said, no, we're going to keep him. It's a form of blackballing. The backlash was not going to be any worse than the discrimination that we were going through and the fact that if we didn't stand up, nothing would happen. So basically, you had no choice. If you had any power, you had to use that power. Yesterday and today, the connections are unavoidable. They're essential, really, considering the madness of modern times. Policemen pulled black people over and hit them across the head and unjustly tried them in courts. And who went to jail? Nobody. It happens every day. But what will stay with you is the power of that image. The image of coming together. The image of standing united. <laughs>